Hello and welcome back to Scar Mechanic. With the Plasma demo being out for the past few weeks, it's been a while since I recorded a Scar Mechanic video, or even played the game for that matter. Because of this, you may think I would start with something simple, but if you know me, you know that isn't what we do here. Today I decided to record a video without a real goal in mind, which eventually led me to create a magnetic tape storage device. This is very similar in concept to the way a VCR reads VHS tapes. This is the first creation I've made that's almost entirely focused on logic, so if you know logic very well, then you may want to start writing your comments right now about how I did it wrong. If you don't know logic very well, then you can stick around to see me complain about how I don't either. Like I mentioned, I started this video without a real goal. I just created a world, added a few mods, and got started. Looking at my mods list, the electromagnet mod piqued my interest because I tried to use it in my differential video, but that didn't work out. Thanks to this comment as well, I also added a new mod called the New Legend mod. This, among other things, provides the ability to fly. I didn't need it a ton here, but it definitely saves some time and will in the future. I took my standard trip out to the edge of the world, this time on a jet bike to switch things up. In order to fly with the New Legend mod, you need to place down and activate this block called the Fly module, which I did on a concrete slab so I didn't lose it. It doesn't really make you fly, it just makes the game think you're always swimming. That also means it's constantly making the swimming sound, which is incredibly annoying, but I got used to it. At first I thought I wanted to make a boat, but after staring at the water for a few minutes trying to decide what kind of boat I wanted to make, let me know if you have any cool boat ideas, I couldn't think of anything interesting and started trying to make a magnetic tape. The way this kind of tape works in real life is that the tape is magnetized in a specific pattern, and then a device such as a VCR can read those specific patterns and interpret them as an image. Now, while this kind of tape storage can have hundreds of thousands of bits in just a single square inch, I wanted to do three blocks per bit. I placed down three rows of four logic gates and then deleted the last two columns for some reason. My idea was that a column would contain three gates, and each of these gates would either be on or off, one or zero respectively. In order to write data to this kind of tape, I would need some way to have these gates be on or off by default, otherwise when you put it on the lift, all of the data would reset. My first thought was to use a sensor facing into the block, as that's what I've done in the past to allow a default on state. I realized quickly that you can't place the sensor facing into the block you're placing it on, so that wasn't going to work. Next I tried a logic gate, before again realizing that there isn't a way to have a logic gate on by default. Finally, for testing purposes, I just decided to use switches, something I wanted to avoid because they would reset to off when put on a lift. I put together a 3x6 array of these switches and magnets, and then moved on for now to try to create the actual tape reader. For the reader, I placed down a platform of extruded metal blocks because my block palette was getting boring. Onto this I placed some bearings and blue pipes. The pipes would act like a conveyor belt to pull the tape through. I also decided to use a controller to rotate the pipes because I thought it would be more consistent. This is a decision I went back on later because the controller likes to snap the pipes to the nearest angle when stopped, leading to inconsistent readings. My first idea to read the data from the tapes was to use magnets on suspension to act as a kind of linear bearing, similar to what I did in the mechanical calculator video. I also used an engine here because if you connect the magnets to an engine you can modify their strength. I thought that as the tape rolled past on the pipes, each suspension would individually respond to its respective spot on the tape, something I could then read with the sensor. I tested it as is by placing down a cardboard block and welding my tape on, followed immediately by my first major realization. Oh, those are all attracted to each other, aren't they? Yes. The three magnets on the reed head were all attracted to each other, meaning they would never move individually. Despite that, I tested it again to find this weird anti-gravity behavior in my second major realization. It would not be possible to have the magnets on the tape all on at the same time, because they would permanently be attracted to the tape head. I call these major realizations because these are pretty much the two factors that influenced every design decision I made from here forward. The first fix I tried to make was to expand the reed head so each magnet had more space between them. I also rebuilt my tape to accommodate this design and made a handful of changes. I added sensors to the back of the tape that would detect a part of the reader I painted white and only activate when that section was being read. I also shifted to using north and south magnets instead of on and off to represent the 1 and 0 bits. All of these changes were in an effort to reduce interference and increase consistency. You can see that this one showed much more promise as the bottom suspension moved when set to 0 strength. Unfortunately, when I set the magnets to be strong enough to overcome the suspension, it became exceedingly unstable. In between big changes here, I also swapped out the pipes for wheels because they have significantly more friction. 
After being pretty confident the many magnet reed head wasn't going to work, I decided to condense it down to just one. Even after this change, I was having trouble trying to get the magnets to overcome the suspension, even with three of the magnets on the tape active at a time, so I decided to redesign this element entirely. I placed down a bearing with a pipe on it and a magnet on top. My idea now was that if the magnetic tape read a north pole, the magnet would be pushed right, and if it was a south pole, it would be pulled left, representing on and off respectively. In here is also where I swapped out the wheels to work on an electric engine instead of the controller like I mentioned before. After some signature scrap mechanic physics and some modifications, I ended up with this, followed by some more scrap mechanic physics issues, and then this, which is pretty much the final reed head design. You can see as I switch the poles of the magnet, the head flips back and forth, something I can read as a data signal from a sensor. After finalizing that, I moved back over to fix the tape design. Now that I had a working reader, it was a little more clear what I needed to do with the tape. I laid out a single row of magnets with alternating solid blocks on top. On the back of these, I placed sensors looking for white blocks just as before to activate only the current segment. The alternating blocks I placed on top are actually to let the reader know where the tape is. I placed a sensor on the top of the reader that looks for these blocks, and it knows that every time a new block is detected, it needs to read a new signal. I wanted to avoid adding anything except magnets into the tape to make it a little more authentic, but with the limits of scrap mechanic, this was my best choice. If you were to look at the patterns in a VHS tape, it's actually very similar. An entire side of the tape is dedicated to just letting the VCR know where it's at. Next, I placed down a seat that I connected to the conveyor belt so that I could run it forward and backward without having to reload the tape, just making my life a little easier. After doing this, I realized that my sensor up top only turned on when a new block was detected, but it actually needed to activate when a block enters and leaves its range. Otherwise, I'm only reading every other magnet. The fix for this issue was just to add what's called an edge detector, which just activates this block every time the sensor state changes instead of only when it turns on. I'll illustrate that here with a button. You can see that the gate pulses when I press and release the button. This was a pretty simple fix and a good transition to working on the logic, a section which I'll keep relatively concise but was actually four hours of trial and error. I at many points almost gave up on this project. The first thing I did was add a memory bit that stores whether the previous red magnet was on or off. I ran into an issue here in testing where the reed head was pulling the tape up and off of the wheels, preventing it from moving further. I'd like to think my solution for this one was actually pretty elegant. Instead of the reed head always being active, I only activate it for one tick to read the tape and then deactivate it. This gives it enough time to read, but not enough time to have any side effects. After that, I spent an extremely long time trying to design a shift register. A shift register is just a group of logic memory cells that, when a new input is provided, shift all of the memory down one cell. I thought this would be perfect because it's a simple memory design that allows continuous input. I started by trying to make it work with these double XOR memory cells. I don't have much to say about this other than no matter what I tried, I could not get it to work. This was the closest I got, but the issue is that I wasn't able to freeze its state, meaning whatever I set the first cell to would immediately cascade to all of the cells. I eventually just decided to look up a diagram for a shift register, which provided me with this design. You can see that if I toggle the switch, nothing happens on the right, but as soon as I press the button, it writes the switch's state to that memory cell. I painted this dark red for input, dark blue for right, and light green for output, a color scheme you'll see with all of my logic. I then duplicated this a bunch of times and wired the output of one into the input of the next. It took some tinkering, but I eventually got it working. I found out that I needed specifically a three-tick signal to write without getting any glitches, which is what this timer circuit does. You can see that as I write a new input, every time I press the button, it pushes that value down one more gate. After getting all that working, I duplicated this four times and wired it up to make what would be the bottom four rows of an 8x8 screen. Just after doing that, I found so many issues with this block, including its large size, that I decided to scrap it and start again. This was one point I definitely almost gave up, after spending over an hour working on this only to realize it didn't really do what I needed it to. It wasn't for nothing though, and I still went over it here because all the concepts I learned from this are exactly what make up the final screen, I just do it in a much better way. Anyway, after that failure, I tried to do something completely different. Shoot spud guns in the shape of the memory so I could carve an image out of cardboard. I ended up moving past this idea pretty quick because I realized that the logic to make that work wasn't different at all and was actually exactly the same as what I needed to do to make a screen. Next, I tried to go back to designing my own circuit, trying to use these four gate memory cells again. Again, I won't talk in too much detail about this because it was 15 minutes of pretty much nothing. 
Another random idea I have was to use pistons and a controller to index between each display pixel, but I found this was wildly inconsistent with such short input pulses, something I was pretty set on using. Finally, I gave up and did what I should have done from the start and looked it up. I knew that Khan had a video on how to create an incrementing display like this, but I wanted to do it myself. After looking at his video, it was pretty simple and I knew what I needed to do. Check out that video for the details, but you can see that every time I press this button, it turns the next memory cell in line on. After having this, all I needed to add was logic to store the current value, done with more memory cells, and logic to ensure it wouldn't override previous cells. You can see here that every time I press the button, it writes the switch's state to the spud gun, shooting the next spud gun in line only if the switch is on. Now imagine that each spud gun was a pixel on the screen, and this is exactly what I need. Next, all I did was take all of this logic and condense it into a single line so it was small enough to make a screen. You can see here that each set of red logic gates was one memory cell from before. I created a single layer of eight of these, wired into the same color logic gates from before for input, output, and write. I also had to add in one more logic gate I forgot, but that was pretty minor. After that, I duplicated this to be eight tall, added logic gates for the screen output, and wired each layer in series. In hindsight, I absolutely should have done this before I duplicated it all because this was a mess, but oh well. And here's what it looks like to write every pixel to be on. This was so satisfying to see after all the headaches I endured to get here. For reference, I started doing logic at 1 hour and 30 minutes into the recording, and this just broke the 4 hour mark. With that massive hurdle completed, I welded this to the original magnetic reader. I wired the new bit to read signal from the reader into the screen's write gate. And you can see that I can now write every pixel to be on based on the speed the tape is moving. Next, I had to wire up the logic to tell the screen if that pixel should be on or off, which is significantly harder than it sounds. I'll summarize this and say that the solution was to extend the pulse a few ticks with this logic that you can kind of see working here. And then I had to remove this screw so the read head automatically reset. This screw is such a frustratingly simple solution, but I spent upwards of 25 minutes trying different logic and magnet combos just to do this job. Anyway, with that done, that's actually the entire creation. Next, all I had to do was write some tapes and run them through. Also, the logic gates painted red are dead pixels. I don't know what broke them, but I ran out of patience to find out. Here's the first one I wrote. It's a pretty simple design. Here's another one, from third person this time, so you can see it function. This tape took me like five tries to get to a spot I liked, so if you can tell what it says, you should listen to it. I'll let this last one roll in the background while I do my outro, but here's the first attempt at it. Not so great. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and feel free to subscribe. If you're interested in another video like this, you can click the card on the screen or check out my channel. This video was one of the most frustrating ones I've ever made, and as of the past two weeks, I have a stockpile of nearly 10 hours of failed video footage from different games. That being said, I'm also really happy with how it turned out, and can see so many ways to improve and remake it, inspiring me to do more logic creations. If that's something you're interested in, let me know in the comments and give me some ideas. I may also do a remake of this one sometime down the line. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.